Good morning. Good evening. Good night. Good afternoon. Good, good day. Afternoon, good day. <laughs> From wherever you all join. So, uh, yeah, we're going to give a couple more minutes for people to start rolling in uh, as that goes. Bathrooms are wherever they are nearby. We can't give you directions to that. But the Q&A is on the bottom of the screen. So just for all of you joining, uh, please, uh, if someone wouldn't mind just validating the Q&A that we sound look, look good, I always like just to have someone ask not a real question, but you can ask a real question. Um, we'll put those up and run with those throughout this entire process. Um, so please use that liberally. Uh, it certainly makes it a whole half a lot more fun when we know what you're thinking. And it's not, uh, although Olaf and I have a bunch of fun just by ourselves, but <laughs> we'd love your help making this even more entertaining. So please use those yeah. as much as possible. I'm going to start sharing my screen. So we have a nice first slide in there. Let me... And the anonymous attendee that was kind enough to throw some validation on what question we want to ask. Appreciate it. It is working. Answer live. I have no idea. Whatever cu you're curious about, but mostly thank you for double checking that it's working. <laughs> test test yes. one two three exactly always good when we start so we'll get on a minute or two and then Olaf and I'll jump in yeah so Brendan where are you located let's uh let's do a sure. little bit of a, a chit chat oh yeah it'd be good and anyone else add uh add some extra location wise from y'all uh I am based just outside of Denver Colorado in a little town called Golden. Uh, we are best known for uh, Coors. The Coors Brewery is based here. So if you like uh, what, what is commonly called the Rocky Mountain Kool-Aid or just Coors Light or just water, depending on whose opinion you're going to check with, uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's what uh, downtown Golden, as well as being the first uh, capital of the state of Colorado. So there you go. Little Little known facts. How about you? I don't know. I'm uh, actually in the Netherlands, uh, Utrecht, and we, of course, have Heineken beer, which is rather well known. And <laughs> if you ask people in the Netherlands, they also have opinions on it. <laughs> yes. I guess that's the, that's the curse and the blessing of microbreweries and like the local ones, which is a good thing, I guess. But, uh, oh, yeah. We got a lot of the microbrews yeah. here. That's our, that's, our, that's our thing for sure. But yeah. Um, but we have a couple of big ones too. So cool. I think we're going to kick it off and then yeah. uh, probably people will uh, jump in uh, while we go. So, uh, welcome everybody to this webinar with a very long title Accelerated Software Development by Combining AI Code Generation and CI CD Automation. Uh, very happy to have you all here and very happy to welcome our special guest, Brandon, here from TAP9. Thank we'll you. do a little bit of an introduction because I have a second slide where we have faces and names. So uh, my name is Olaf Molenfeld. I'm technology advisor at CircleCI. Came in through an uh, acquisition of a company called FAMP, which I co-founded. And one of the companies that started the progressive delivery stuff, moving to the right. And of course, with code generation, test generation, we also are moving to the left and to the right, which we will see in, in demos and Brandon will explain. So uh, welcome, Brandon, very happy to have you here. And maybe you can so much. give a little bit of an introduction about Tap9 and yourself. Sure, so uh, background wise, I uh, spent about a decade at IBM, about a decade at Google, kind of founding with the founding team at Google Cloud, some time at uh, GitLab. And then Tab9 here, uh, I lead up really uh, built out our sales and go to market. But tab nine, for context for everyone, were the uh, originators of the uh, AI assisted coding um, and code generation. Uh, we've been at it for really 10 years, but from an LLM, which we'll get into those, but on the notion of generative AI, first ones to even begin tackling that five years ago. And um, our goal, of course, is to deliver uh, safe, secure, uh, private code uh, completions and uh, compliant way to kind of customers across the globe. Uh, we work and have a million, million and a half 
developers that use Tab9 uh, on a weekly basis uh, and a vast majority of them on a daily basis to help them write the world's code. We we did some back of the envelope, and it, I think it figures we're probably writing, help write about 2 to 3% of the world's code is written actually by Tab9. With your approval, and we'll get in all the important parts about that, there's there's more to it than uh, that, but uh, that's a little background on Tab9. Uh, we're kind of split company, split between U.S. and uh, we've got a team in Israel as well. Okay, thank you very much. A lot of buzzwords, which we'll get into <laughs> later on, and uh, but it sounds uh, awesome and very interesting. And uh, I think this is like really cutting edge stuff. And uh, of course, as any new technology, there's pros, there's cons, there's dangers, there's opportunities. So we'll uh, we'll see what we can learn. Um, so this is the agenda. We will get to the goals of this webinar to recap basically what we want to get out of this thing. And then Brandon will talk about how AI code generation works, or how TEP9 um, performs in this space. Then we're going to move into pros and cons of code generation and how adding CI CD automation to the equation can reduce the risk and, and increase performance and optimize all these cool possibilities that you have with code generation. Then we're going to do a live demo, fingers crossed. I did some hello world, so it's not jinxed, I hope. And then uh, we do a recap and Q&A. So goals of this webinar, to make sure that I am and Brandon, and we're all on the same page here, <laughs> uh, very important. Uh, it's very powerful, obviously. All the stuff that LLMs and all kinds of machine learning can apply is super powerful, as we all know. I've been creating songs lately with my kids which are actually really not bad. So, uh, <laughs> but they're also very bad ones. So it's also dangerous, but uh, anyway, it's, it's cool stuff, but the, with great power comes great responsibility. And in this webinar, we'll dive into how code generation actually works, what to kind of uh, look for and, and take care of, what kind of decisions you need to make, uh, pros and cons, like I said, and then we're gonna talk about how to reduce the risks and increase the, the, the what we call the positive feedback loop uh, by adding automation and we get into this nice little infinity loop thing. 100%. So uh, Brendan, yes. how does code generation, which I call CG here, I don't know if that's actually a thing, but uh, let's call it CG, how does this actually work and how does TEP9 uh, play in this space? Of course. Yeah. So I think this is going to be, let me go to full slideshow view. Olaf's going to validate that that looks correct. Sound good? Looks awesome Excellent. to me. So um, I think a couple of things, first off, uh, questions wise, uh, we went through agenda that said, uh, very, very interested to make sure everyone gets your questions out of the, whatever's in the front of your head. So just human nature, the questions you came, which you all came with questions, are ones that are going to be circulating in your head until you sort of get them out and say, this is what I want to understand. So love to have you add the questions in Q&A. Uh, allows me to bring context. It means that, hey, it might be something that I would talk about. It might be something I just add context to, same with Olaf as we go through this. So add your questions and things you're hoping to learn. Worst case scenario, Olaf and I would be happy to individually or jointly Going if it's you know more depth, we'll we'll address it and say, hey, maybe that's something we can go into some more depth and, and help you understand a little bit more more detailed. So we're gonna go a little bit of this. Um, we're gonna do a couple of things today. I want to give you some background on kind of where we've been. So a little bit of uh generative AI applied to the code use case. Uh to be clear, I'm also gonna try and give you some frameworks as we go through this for thinking about adopting and using generative AI, period. This is for the code use case, and you're going to get into the the reason that the the adoption and the first use case that most people are tackling with code generation and generative AI is, or I sorry, with, let me say that one more time. The primary reason that generative AI is being applied to code first has to do actually with the po po point that Olaf will bring around is you have a human in the loop and there's good checks and balances in a pipeline. Those are the two primary reasons why that's going to be one that's adopted perhaps for example, much earlier than some that might be customer facing, don't have good validation, et cetera. We'll get into kind of the whys, but let's begin a little context of kind of sort of where we are, where we're going and sort of how, how this will evolve. And we'll put some good data to it and try and you know uh, put some color to it as we go. So uh, really today, and I 
I'd even sort of say this was yesterday. It's t t today or yesterday. Really was the notion of AI-assisted coding. Um, think of this, and you'll see this in the demos, that this is really about uh, auto-completion on steroids. Think longer completions, a couple lines, super contextually aware of what you're writing. Uh, this was really one of the primary early, it was our use case when Tab9 first started. Uh, it's extremely effective. Uh, it requires different LLMs. We'll get into that. Uh, each LLM has different structure, trade-off to, to what you're using. But that AI-assisted coding was very much about a high velocity, high context to what you as an individual developer are doing. Um, we've really shifted, and, and the productivity on that, it would write uh, complete for most developers, 30 to 40% of their code, translates into about a 20% productivity uh, lift. So that's what we saw really across, across our many customers over the last three, four years. We really now are writing in that sort of middle section here, which I would say is the AI-assisted software development. This area is going to incorporate quite a few more capabilities. So it's going to be code explanation. It's going to be unit testing. It's going to expand the capabilities. And that got expanded by growth of the size of the LLMs. It got growth in terms of data aware. We'll get into kind of why we're able to deliver on that. And at this point, we're looking instead of a really 20%, really a 50% productivity or a 2x. Um, uh, it's actually 50. We're seeing high 50s is sort of the numbers we're seeing right now. And then in the future- Can I ask something, uh, Brandon? Heck yeah, jump in. Yeah, so these, these numbers, uh, yes. I assume that how, how do you kind of measure those, those kind of, I, I understand there's a little bit oh, of sure. marketing involved, but I guess there's also data points that you actually use. 100%, yeah, so I'd say there's, there's two pieces here. So um, in terms of how tab nine has measured them, we measure them with partners like Accenture, CINT, Cognizant, and you run two sprints. Team doing the same subject, same thing with Type 9, same without. So we're looking at actual productivity through a sprint is how we did uh, a lot. We do most of these measurements. The second one, which as much as that's interesting, but I'm, you know, as my shirt says, Tab 9, <laughs> you should take uh, not just my word for it, but there's some really good studies that we have been put out there from McKinsey, from um, Gartner, a number of others. We've pulled those all together. Uh, if you're interested, uh, when we switch over, I will send you a link if you're interested to these studies. Uh, we pulled together the the total economic impact and some really good data, all external validated data, not tab nines. We have our own data, happy to share it, uh, but this is a combination of both and they've been really consistent. And if I'm gonna be super blunt, since let's be blunt, we're gonna have this conversation. In our space is really two players. Uh, there's us and Microsoft Copilot. Copilot has said the same thing. Uh, and I should say actually GitHub Copilot to be very specific. Uh, they're, they've released very similar information. So the data is pretty consistent across the board right now. But good question and uh, good note. I'll put a note to myself. I'll add a link into the chat here for everyone on if you're going to, going to do reading on the economic side. Happy to add that. So I'll add that after I turn it over to you and I go find it, which I have it on short notice. Uh, good. So I think the uh, this covers most of it. I'm not going to talk about it like uh, AI software driven. Um, there's a lot of noise out there uh, around this notion that it could be uh, instead of augmenting a developer, which is really how we think of this, think of it more like a... Um, Think of it Iron Man, like it's Iron Suit to help you from a brain standpoint. That's how we operate is really making the developer, the developers at the center. And we look at that, our, our job is to make the developer productive. And we'll see some of it, I'll highlight some of it in Olaf's points. This next point, interesting. I think we're there's going to be aspects of it that we get to AI software driven. Testing will probably be the first one. And by that, I mean like unit testing, uh, writing a lot of that because there's good, consistent process data validation. But this is certainly well in the future. And I think there's some maturity, both with the models and all the tooling and everything around it before we'd get there. So we're spending most of our time really right in this middle area. Um, let me let me give you a, a framework to think about generative AI. Generative AI is really has always anything, always has three pieces to it, not anything, but any of the generative AI tools. It's gonna have the UI UX. That means getting the right suggestion, the right user at the right time, uh, part that's not trivial there's the model part which we'll talk about and there's also the data aspect 
Each one of those are ones you should think about when you're putting together a solution. Um, I'm going to address those kind of here today. So when we look at what tab nine uh, looks at, uh, the, the aspect that we came from our, our history was even before we were doing used LLMs, uh, we were semantic search. And the goal and what we focused on was, again, getting the right suggestion, the right user at the right time from the right model and all the above with the right data. Um, what that required was a whole bunch of stuff on fine tuning. But the hardest part probably is all the integrations and getting um, the right suggestion in the right place. So example, let me be clear on this. Tab9 uses three different LLMs at any one time, something like a two, three billion model, parameter model that runs on your laptop, super fast, designed to make sure you stay right in frame as you're writing your code. So think like autocomplete on steroids. A second model that runs in a uh, on a cloud or in your own VPC, that's gonna be for longer code completions. And then a third model that is really a chat model, and that's going to operate dramatically slower. And that's going to be, you know, we're talking, those are very large models uh, from ones that we built. And then we also allow uh, model flexibility to use anything from like a Google Gemini, a G chat GPT, a Claude, if that's what you want. Those have implications, what we'll get into. So trade-offs you need to make. Um, but uh, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, Cool. Next one, next area. Uh, let me talk a bit about models. Uh, we're not going to hit this at the level that probably most people want. So could go in detail. Huge number of models. What you're looking at here is a tree of all the models that are out there. And there's some trade-offs. There's not plus or minus. There's trade-offs in terms of the choices you make. Um, the first one is sort of an open versus closed model. So open models are going to things like a um, llama, any of the llama models. Uh, now, the Gemma, not Gemini, but the Gemma models from Google, um, there's some stuff out of uh, Databricks. There's a number of open source models. Uh, Tab9 leverages these very large open source models as the basis for what we build uh, and deliver. Um, there's also closed source models, and those aren't good or bad, uh, but I will say closed source models are almost always, in fact, they're always uh, delivered to as an API and inside of a cloud. So... Uh, the open models are, you can run anywhere. The closed models are designed to drive, drive consumption on the cloud that they're running on. Um, so good or bad, but it has different business model and, and trade-offs. Uh, the other thing about models, they tend to be single or multimodal. Single mode would be something like, I'm only focused on, say, code. Multimodal would be, I can do code, I can do uh, pictures, I can do, um, you know, in any number of things. What we think of when you think Bad of- songs. Bad songs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Audio, all the above. We are trained. So I want to really draw a, a point here. We are trained right now to think of the world as one, as very large multimodal models. Hence, who's got the biggest models? GPT-4. It's Gemini 1.5. It's like, but here's the thing. Those are useful when you have no idea what problem you're trying to solve. What we're talking about, where the world is headed is specific, single modal, smaller models designed for specific use case. A focused model with the correct data will always, always out both outperform and much lower cost than a very large model. So that gets to that size. That size matters, uh, not only in terms of the speed that you can get it out of, but certainly the cost. Um, and the last one is the training data that's used. Um, we'll get a little, this kind of bridges into the data aspect, but it's very, very important. And a lot of people are asking the question of, hey, is my, my data used to train the model? It's important. That's a valuable question to ask. And most companies at this point have not landed in the answer of, uh, you can opt out of it. For context, Tab9 has never used any user's data and never will to train our models. We use only fully permissive open source data. That matters. And the reason it matters is a trade-off you have to make. We only train fully permissive open source, which means that any data that comes out of the model can only be fully permissive open source or your data if it's trained on yours. So you're 100% secure in that situation. Super important trade-off here. That though, however, think of it this way. Oracle Java code is very, very good Java code. But if I train on it, it will be something that you will get in your code base. This is very important to trade-off have to answer. The EU four weeks ago said you can't have copyrighted data in your big models. We'll see how that plays out. The Congress just said no using of any co-pilots at all because of the data that's in them. We don't know how this will play out, but it's an important aspect to really be asking as you adopt 
Uh, these tools and other tools, it's not just code, but in this case, we're talking code. Last piece kind of running through this is we're talking about awareness. So this is the data. There's data that goes into the model, which was what I talked about, fully permissive open source in the case of tab nine. But it's also the additional data you would add, to add the additional context that gives you the best suggestions based on what you're doing. And it can go- This, is, left this is basically real time, right? This is kind of SU work. Right. Yeah, yes, yes. And these are incorporated and in, think of this more as like a layer cake. You can get start with a really solid model and then it can get better, better, better. And there's different tools to this. We're not going to get into, do we want to use a rag or do we want to use, you know, vector database or are we using grounding? There's a bunch of tools or ways or fine tuning ways you can think about these models. That's an aspect that we do at tab nine to help people from adoption. But some companies we have have done a great job and built their own model and they want to incorporate and use tab nine for that UI UX, get the right suggestion, right user, right time. So there's multiple ways you can engage with it. But what you should really understand is kind of from left to right, each one of these is an additional step that helps get the right suggestion and ground the, the, um, the suggestions in your data, right? Because really what we're hitting at when we get to code is the way that one team writes good Java code looks different than the crafty old Java, but that may be exactly how you want to write it. So this is the aspect that everyone's going to have to start thinking more about. Um, that said, again, we approach this, give you a great starting point, and then we help you move up that maturity curve as you kind of go. So maturity curve, think of it like start with basic context, awesome, which we kind of hit the context here. As you go from context, then you connect and can add your own data. Think all of your repositories, connection to Jira, Confluence, really that is all the things around your software development in your pipelines, if you have good data coming out of the pipelines. Um, then coaching is, I want it to done exactly this way. So Brandon, I'm not a great developer. Olaf, a much better developer. If I join the team, I want to have Olaf suggestions in terms of how I start and write code, right? Now that requires that you understand that Olaf's a good developer, you know, Olaf's code. There's some work that you have to do. So as always, good data is really the core to anything in machine learning. Make sure you're focused there. And then you can even go further into kind of customization. Each one of these is personalization about making what is a good base solution better uh, in your world. Um, in terms of what you're seeing. So everyone's asking, hey, what do we get out of these? Obviously the code completion is kind of known, but at this point, these are the kind of questions that Tab9 can offer, answer. Refactoring code, how to write a Kafka stream, what is the documentation, how do I write the documentation? Because let's be honest, we don't do that well. <laughs> we don't write great unit tests. All of those are questions and aspects that Tab9 can offer either inline or through Tab9 chat, all are integrated into your ID of choice, right? Tab9, we look at all IDs as valuable. Uh, so we work with Clips and we work of course with VS Code and all the Microsoft stuff that's uh, that Copilot, you know, is is designed into, but we help you with the JetBrains world and everyone else because developers are everywhere and, and we think that's that's helpful. Okay. Awesome, awesome, fun. Let's do some pros and cons. On Woo! Woo. Hey. <laughs> that was uh, oh. quite an uh, info dump, but uh, so, I think it's yes. helpful to see yeah. all those 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 kind of build-ups and build like you say, layered cakes. Yeah, it, it's and honestly, you always come back to the basic thing. Everything's got a UI UX. So a good UI UX, just an API call is not a UI UX. So like, how do you really get those suggestions, understand what they are, do pre post processing, mm -hmm. the model, and then the data that goes into it. And if you think about generative AI from that aspect, it's pretty easy to break down any solution into those components. And you can understand where they're strong, where they're weak, what you need, what you as a customer might want to build, what you need to have for data, et cetera. Yeah. Um, one of the things we talked a little bit about this, we said, hey, percentage wise, um, let me just orient everyone for just a second what you're looking at. This circle is all of the time a developer on average spends. Clearly, it varies from senior developers to junior developers to et cetera. But on average, this is the kind of places that developers spend. All those numbers add to 100%. And each one of those is kind of the areas that, that uh, they spend. And across the board, particularly Tab9 Chat, there's aspects from documentation, code review, testing that now Tab9 helps developers with. And that's a 58%, what we're seeing internally is about a 58%, actually a 58% on average productivity lift. So is that a pro? Heck yes. There's a bunch of stuff in there that you would like to be able to automate tasks that you'd be able to like to quickly move through and allow you to really focus on what differentiates you on writing, you know, unique differentiated code. Um, how, 
here's a piece that we kind of get into. So there's a couple pieces to think about on the, this is kind of pro con and it's uh, 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 both sides to this. Uh, first off, privacy. So there's two aspects of privacy you hit on. One, what data goes into the model and also um, where that's hosted. So uh, again, some customers or some startups might not care whatsoever. And they're like, great, give me the tool that's seen the most code in the world and you're off and running. And being blunt, that's probably Copilot because Microsoft has looked at a huge amount of data from a whole bunch of proprietary sources, copyrighted data, a lot of other data. And it's good data, so it makes for uh, a strong model. A uh, challenge on that is most large companies, banks, uh, healthcare companies, uh, et cetera, don't want code in there. They want to know that their code doesn't leave. And the vast majority of them would then want to run that in your own VPC. So think or on prep. So this is going to be an aspect of codes, the differentiator to every company, every company is a digital company. And if that code's important and it's valuable, which it is, and you want maximum control and security around it, you don't want your code going in out an API into a big model, uh, in a big black box. That's one that you often customers want to be able to control. That's an aspect to think about um, uh, in terms of how that goes. Tabnet again can drop into your OpenShift cluster or your cloud of choice, just like Circle. So you're going to see a parallel here in terms of where you guys want to run stuff. Second, we talked a bit about the personalization. Um, you can personalize a model that's smaller and focused. It's both possible to personalize it, and it's going to be a lot more valuable because it's your model, right? And so we talked a bit about that data aspect before on the customization. This is super important. Uh, and again, I to give you a picture of where this is going in two or three, if we go maybe two or two years forward, right now, those big models are kind of the place everyone starts. But if we fast forward, where we're seeing uh, the bleeding edge companies with tab nine are doing, it's tab nine, but they have a different model for the front end team, one for the data science team, one for the DevOps team, a different one for, you know, their COBOL to Java conversion, one for their, you know, Python, custom Python, big Python applications. These custom models are dramatically more valuable, but they do take a little more work. So I think what we're going to see clearly, even in the code space is over time, you're going to have a plethora of models that are purpose fit. So when you start coding, you're going to say, which model do I want? It's this model that's trained on this data with these, these tuned in this way, help me be a better developer when I'm working on today, or if I join a new team. Um, and the last one that you just have to weigh, and it's super important and become more important, like I said, from a legal standpoint is what could win in the models, right? This is machine learning one one good data in, good data out, bad data in, bad data out, data out. Proprietary data from players you don't want in your code in, that will come out, right? And that's the last piece to just weigh that. I think it's an important aspect. Um, again, it's a trade-off because it's, there's a lot of data out there that's very valuable that's copyrighted. But if you take it, it does have, it by definition can be put in your code base. So that's an aspect just to ways you kind of go through uh, through these choices. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it back to Olaf and we're gonna go through what is the really important aspect. Writing good, fast, better code, awesome. It's not useful if you can't test it. It's not useful if it doesn't meet your requirements. And so these two need to be together. And if anyone asks me the question, and I'll preempt it, that says, can tab nine write me more secure code? Yes and no. Yes, perhaps it can help. But if you're doing that and you don't have a pipeline and everything else and testing in place, it will likely make things dramatically worse because you have higher velocity of code than, uh, than if you didn't use these models. So foundationally, you need to have a really good uh, pipeline set up before you start adopting these tools. So there you go. Hey, yeah, Olaf, jump on in. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. That's uh, that's super interesting. It, it almost feels like I've got this car. This car drives. It helps me to do my job. And now I basically replace the engine, and all of a sudden I can go like from 100 miles per hour to 300 miles per hour with all the risks involved. And I need to have like safety belts and whatever stuff in place to actually make sure. 100. percent that's a great it's analogy. like switching from uh, from uh, I don't know a Subaru to a Ferrari, and then <laughs> and then still hoping to get in, in yeah. at your end destination. Yeah. yeah, go for it, but make sure that you have uh, you know the the three po or four four point harness on, and when you decide to go doing that four point yeah point, I always get that wrong, and I have brothers yeah, that yeah. race. I should know, <laughs> but if you yes, make sure you have that on, and that's 
that's the aspect yeah. that you need to have in place here. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, Brandon and I, we, we were talking about like, what are these pros? What are these cons? How, how, and then we we figured out like, yeah, it, it's again, a, a multi-layered approach. And what, what CICD uh, as an automation engine effectively, because we're moving into deploy and release and machine learning uh, features. It's basically automation from a very high level standpoint. It's adding automated scans and checks and, and, and yeah, to, to, the, to the code generation to help humans basically do their work even better. Um, but also adding, for example, manual gates because humans still have a place in all of this. I don't know how, how it is in 10, 20, whatever years, but I, I believe the creativity of, of, of a human is always needed. And, and yeah, there's always a, a different angle and how you can and take a look at things. So a manual gate is also an important thing. Guardrails and efficiency, uh, making sure that, that people don't go off the tracks, uh, which a CI/CD system can definitely help in. And then there's reuse and best practices. For example, in CircleCI, we have orbs. Um, there's things, the templates that you can apply. Uh, so basically make sure that, that, that what people do with code generation and with machine learning is also being filtered or validated by your best practices. And, and I guess that the models, but I'm checking with Brandon, the models can even be trained against those templates and orbs. So yep. yeah, you actively that, that's great data. The can orbs include actually, them. Yeah, orbs are a great feedback. That's into you know customizing that model. The orbs are a phenomenal uh, data point to to, to train train against. Yeah, because it's it's good data. Like like you said, garbage in, garbage out. So the moment you know this is the good stuff, and you give it higher priority, then you get this positive feedback loop that we're kind of aiming for, right? Exactly. Yeah, cool. Yep. Um, so very quickly, like uh, maybe people are like, what is CICD again? And or how is this kind of related to what we're talking about with code generation? This is effectively an automation pipeline that orchestrates uh, your workflows and, and the jobs that you need to do by applying these orbs, these templates, uh, and then executing things like, uh, like Brendan says, either on our build infrastructure or on-prem or a combination of those. And, and like I said, we, we support all kinds of different things like, like ARM, uh, Intel, but also IBM main, mainframes, even uh, Apple, Xcode, uh, NVIDIA GPUs. So that, that's a very uh, powerful uh, infrastructure that you can use to, to basically do these scans, do these builds, and, uh, and, and make sure that you get a feedback loop where you get a notification. And then this thing in the bottom here is new because release orchestration was always like a separate thing. We're talking about CI, CD, but effectively releasing something in production with Canary releasing blue-green uh, deployments on, uh, on Kubernetes or an AWS SageMaker or uh, using Argo rollouts. These are effectively the three uh, systems that we currently support, but it's a modular architecture so we can kind of extend it. Uh, that, that's the new stuff that we're moving to the right that we can add to, uh, to your automation. Yep. And um, just one yeah. thing on that, Olaf, real quick on back on that, that I think is useful for everyone to be, when you, everyone thinks or t is talking about generative AI, particularly around the code space, every cloud right now is saying they want all the workloads and they want you tied into the workloads. And so it's really important, I think, that flexibility, what we found, if you're all in in one cloud, everything's in one place, like, hey, that's a reasonable bet to make. Um, yeah. But most people want to be, able to access the best thing from the best cloud and, and, and other providers. You guys offer that through orbs. And then in terms of d d deployment locations, to be clear on the generative AI side, these are tightly coupled uh, by Microsoft, Google, and Amazon on their platforms because they want the consumption and they want the usage. And that may be the right choice, it's a trade-off, but if you are in multiple clouds or you need that flexibility, this is what Circle's talking about, and that's consistent with and why how uh, Tab Nine views it as well. Um, yeah, you're future proof, right? You could go where. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, like uh, a lot of people don't even actually actually know that Circle CI, for example, also has, a, has an on-premise server product uh, and a, and a cloud offering, and then the infrastructure can be hybrid. So it's it's like horses for courses. You you choose what works for you. 
and the world is never black or white. It's always some somewhere in between, in gray, and 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 having the options. I guess that's the, that's the most most important thing. So um, I will skip this slide. But the thing is, our vision is about like software is an ID problem. And, and not a delivery problem. That's the real thing. So we, when we, we need to move faster, we want to move faster, uh, but we need to have the confidence. Again, it's the car. The car can go faster, so you need, you need to have the tools in place to make sure you have the confidence to deliver your IDs faster to your uh, customers. And we do this with at scale. So that's really, uh, we learn a lot by these uh, 2 million developers that use CircleCI, 90 million or more jobs every month. Uh, 6,000 orbs. So it's it's really massive, the, the data points that we get. We just uh, released a report of uh, of all these data points that we analyzed. It's on LinkedIn or in, in our CircleCI blog post. You can, can look for it. But it's really interesting to see how these things kind of add up and um, how people are using those, uh, those systems. And then basically, when, because we're talking about code generation and machine learning AI, uh, again, automation is the key, but not only automation, but also applying human intervention, human checks uh, to make sure that you don't need to do all these steps, but you kind of loop through uh, the things that you can automate and create a loop and then add humans in the loop where needed. And then also in the case of code generation, make sure that, that you hook up the, the machine learning and AI systems at the right place. And it's all about interfaces. And like Brandon says, having the options, the possibilities to kind of mix and match and doing these things. Yeah. So the early pipelines really help a velocity. And so as Olaf switch into demo time, yeah, the, you know, when, when you write good code or you have a mistake in your code, as a developer, getting that immediate feedback uh, on, uh, on the code you wrote so that you can make those adjustments if it didn't meet other requirements that the company has super super valuable and over time it's a you know reinforcing um loop but you have to have the loop and if you don't have the loop <laughs> you're just screwed gonna, <laughs> you're just gonna be you're gonna drown in the code you're gonna drown in code and and that's uh yeah. important to, no one wants to drown in the code i can assure you yeah yeah and um i'm gonna switch now to to my uh, screen and the live demo but one of the interesting things that i kind of experienced when when uh playing around with this is the non-deterministic nature of uh, LLMs and machine learning, because you can never kind of be 100% sure that the result that you get at some point in time will not be different in another point of time. So that's this why is... you always need to validate things. Yeah, and it's particularly, we talked about multiple models, the bigger the model, so the chat model, how you ask the question in a chat interface, will result in quite different can prompt engineering. We've all sorted to hear about that yeah. versus a lot. The shorter ones are going to be a lot more consistent because the possibilities are much, much smaller, right? So it'll be interesting. You're going to see both as you go through it, but um, yeah, we're all going to be prompt engineers. So sorry yeah. is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, demo time, fingers crossed. Uh, did my hello world thingy. So uh, should be good. I created a, a little demo project, very simple. It's basically a, a Circle CI project with a very basic pipeline. And uh, I'm gonna use uh, tab nine in my IDE to, uh, as a very junior, simple, not experienced with prompt engineering at all user, because the framing is important. Because like Brendan says, it is how you drive the system. If you ask it the wrong questions or in the wrong way, it might give you results that are not what you expect. So um, I'm basically gonna use tab nine in my IDE to, to generate some PHP code. And then I have this very simple uh, pipeline in, in Circle CI. And I think I always like the fact that you can set this up in, in less than five minutes, but it's basically um, pulling some code, checking out the code, uh, we do some ch checks here, like are we running PHP in our convenience image? Uh, because Circle CI has a lot of these images uh, that, that you can pull and, and use in your pipelines. And then I do it in my hello world, not to jinx the demo. And then I have uh, basically my single workflow. 
that has uh, two stat or two jobs build. That's this thing here, and then deploy. Normally we do things in parallel to speed things up, but now I want to do it sequentially. So I said requires build. So first build, if build finishes, then deploy is done. So this the thing doesn't do almost nothing, uh, but we will see how we can extend it. So uh, I create a new file and I'm gonna ask tab nine. And this is like, this is the, the tab nine, no pro, nothing. Just bare bones. Um, yeah, this is going to be chat. We haven't customized this to with the orbs. We've done anything. No. This is what you would get. No. Uh, every, Very every basic. Can get it. Yep. Yeah. Create some PSP code to log in and use a reduced name and password. I'm a beginner. I'm a newbie. So, and then tab nine is going to give me some PHP code. That's cool. I don't need to write it myself. That gives me some explanation around it, which is also nice. And so, so it's it's like my rubber duck. I, uh, I I talk to it and it just guides me along. I copy this, I paste it here, and then save it. Hit login. I need to save it in the right folder, obviously. One thing for everyone that uses tab nine, there's multiple ways that you, the default setting is you will be running a large LLM on your laptop. So just for those of you that have, uh, uh, are running it locally as well, you'll get both. You'll be using a, a cloud part and a local version. Just know you're going to use a fair amount of consumption because that's your own personal LLM designed for and looking at what you're writing in your code base and uh, in your open files and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. So in case you're wondering what it is, that's why it takes up some memory. Cool. Um, so I saved this file, committed it, and then I'm going to sync it to my repo. You notice that we have this very cool VS Code extension, which basically, um, yeah, is an in integration of our pipelines into your IDE. I can also do this in my dashboard. I see the same thing. But this is nice, context switching. I don't need to switch around. And I basically see that everything is green. Build and deploy. So I can look here, spinning up environment, show PHP version, yeah, that works. Then I did my deploy steps, echo hello world, all fine. Now, PHP code committed to production, it's there, it's available. But now, what's the thing? If I was a more experienced developer, I would look at this code and say, mm, I don't know. There's a few things that I can improve here. Hashing of passwords, but there's this tricky thing here. And uh, basically, we will add a sneak, a scanning tool. Because that's what we're talking about. Automation can allow you to add scanning and, and, and to your pipeline. So I will add uh, a scanning step to my pipeline, to my config file, and then we'll see um, if the scanning tool, in this case, it's sneak, can be all kinds of things. We have orbs for this, like we, we told, uh, and see if this thing is actually secure, if we want to have this information. So I created a new config, so we have this orb, so I can very easily add it to my pipeline. And then it's a question of adding these steps, sneak install. I wanna see the sneak version just for our safe, for, for demo purposes, and then I do a static code scan. So over here. And you see these red lines. And the cool thing here is also that we can actually, in my IDE, validate uh, the, the configuration of my CircleCI pipeline. Because that's of, often a thing. Like I need to push it and run it and then see if it actually works. Now it tells Your me no. It's broken. Yeah, broken. I see. Yeah, config <laughs> broken. And if I would train 
uh, tab nine, I, it can actually help me to to fix this uh, configuration. Yeah, if you want to, uh, just if it run, learns, uh, highlight that and ask it. Go ahead, just say, "Hey, how can I fix this?" Just highlight the code and like highlight it, and then open tab nine. We'll do this for fun. Open just. No, uh, I'm not gonna do it. It's will jinx, oh, jinx my demo. Jinx it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I won't do it. <laughs> but you could do that. You could ask it questions. I don't promise the answers all the time, but that is something that if something's not working. Hey, this is broken. Hey, how could I fix it? Yeah. Um, and again, yeah. the, the more context it has in terms of your environment, uh, the better it can do that. And it'll naturally learn this as you go. Just for context, everyone, tab nine will learn based off what you're individually doing just by default. So said another way, day one with tab nine with some coding, it's good. Day two, it's better. By day three, it's like, wow, it's reading my mind. That's because it's building that context through your local customized uh, rag, just yeah. for everyone's context. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's uh, there are some really uh, cool next things that we can do. Maybe a demo to to as in second demo. I will update my pipeline, basically, and then we'll see what happens. Um, so there's a new one running. Same steps, build and deploy, but now we've added this. Uh, Sneak scan. So we see basically install dependencies, store sneaks, Eli, for, and then it will show me the version of sneak to just to check. And then we see basically a big red cross here, and it says severity high SQL injection. And the same thing we will see here in the IDE. So it basically tells me run code scan. No, there was a SQL injection. So by adding these automation steps like scans in the pipeline, you make sure that even though people don't prompt the code generation correctly or there's training data in there that might not be okay, maybe there's context within your workspace or in your project where somebody else created flaw code that the system picked up. So there's like, like Brendan says, there's all kinds of context around it that might screw you up. And then this automation can help you to, to uh, basically put the safety nets in place. Um, uh, interestingly enough, like I said, we CircleCI also has uh, AI-based features and I can click here, explain this error, just like I could do in the IDE, obviously. And then uh, we run a, 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 a basically a little AI integration and it says, hey, it's a SQL injection. This is how you could fix it. This is an example of correct code, et cetera. So I can do this on different levels and it's really helpful and powerful to, to quickly figure out like what's going on. How can I kind of work around this? In this case, I'm gonna do it in my IDE and ask tab nine to uh, fix my code. So I'm gonna go to my code again and then Say, okay, can you fix the SQL injection issue? Sure. Ah, that's nice. And then uh, I do show diff, insert. Ah, here. So I see basically I can accept incoming change. So there's a escape uh, block now added. And uh, if I save this code, uh, fixed SQL injection error or issue. It was not an error, it was an issue, potential issue. Sync it up. Yeah, this Let's is great. This I... is exactly the 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 internal re feedback loops that are necessary in moving quickly. Yeah, so it's basically you have this chat option. You can explain the code. Uh, the Circle CI system can help you to figure out what's going on. Tab nine uh, code generation can help you to figure out what's going on. Everything kind of works together, and then basically. 
we see a successful build. Of course, now Sneak says, awesome, no issues were found. So even though I'm very junior, I just took the code that was given to me. Now I've learned. The system has basically protected me and told me like, okay, there's an issue there. It might become an issue because you want to push this to production. Don't do it, fix it. And then I ask the, the code generation again, can you help me to fix this? And I can, of course, tell, tell me a little bit more about SQL injection. And now hopefully next time I'm a better developer. And then I don't make the code. Or I prompt the system. Like, can you give me PHP code that does this and make sure that there's no SQL injection in there? And then it will probably give me the, the code that it generated the second time. Um, and then one last thing that I wanted to quickly show is basically what we're talking about. It is machine learning AI that generates code based on training and context. We now added automation to the equation by adding the, uh, the orb that does the uh, scanning. But I can also very easily add a manual uh, check in there to make sure that there's always a human in the loop. Uh, and we'll show you how that works in CircleCI. It's basically uh, adding uh, what we call an approval uh, step. So if I do this, I add an additional uh, um, job here after build. And I call it hold and it's an approval and it requires build. And then as a deploy requires hold. And again, I'm a junior developer. So I want to make sure that my that my configuration is valid. Yeah, it's valid. Cool. And now I'm going to save it. Edit manual gate. Sync it. Let me collapse. So now it's running again. We have a fixed code. And we can check where we are. We are These here. builds are super, super speedy just for context. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, well done. like I said, we were Having been in a space, like this is super fast, so it's great. Yeah, it, it's not the biggest project, obviously, but uh, we, we use caching uh, at very advanced level because we run these big scale uh, pipelines for uh, large enterprises. We know how to do the caching in, in the right way. And you notice that the whole step is now here. Needs approval, it says. And I can even do it from, from my IDE. I don't need to context switch here if I want to. I can do it in my IDE, obviously, or, or in my web UI, or even use the CLI. And then I said approve. And now hold a success. And then I step to the next step. So basically, like three iterations. Very basic, no checks and balances. Crappy code can go into production. Added scanning with orbs, few little lines very easy to do. And then all of a sudden we have the safety nets and now very few lines in my pipeline added. And we actually have a human in the loop. This is all like locked and uh, it's super powerful and, and pipelines can really grow. And, and now I think this is a, a nice example of how code generation can be combined with the automation of CICD, manual steps and actually create this, this feedback loop that helps you to get the best out of uh, what code generation can offer because it's never 100% foolproof. So you need to layer these things. Um, I'm going to switch back to my slides. Nailed it. We have a recap. So uh, Brandon, <laughs> what's your recap of this? <laughs> I, I think this was, this was, Ah uh, yes, we got questions. P keep keep hammering. So, uh, attendees, yeah. thank you. Um, I, I think we've we've hit the key pieces, which is, um, hey, now's the time to ad adopt generative AI. Uh, I think it's particularly for code. Uh, it's a uh, showing great promise, easy to adopt. Um, make your trade offs. So again, I think what I'm saying is, 
make your choice, uh, whether security and compliance are a big deal, then, you know, I think tab nine is a good fit. If you're more flexible, you know, maybe co-pilot, but those are kind of your two options. Uh, I'd say, Hey, get started now, get, get going after it. Uh, either case, the key pieces, you need to have uh, a really good pipeline and uh, the suspenders and the belt on while you're building and shipping this code. So in every case, you should be leveraging circle on this um, to, to build it out. And uh, I think, the last one is just, hey, experiment and know that it's moving quickly. Uh, I, I know on both sides, but uh, I know on the generative AI side, uh, the models are evolving quickly. Um, the data will always be the most important. And all the UI UX is just continues to be more and more fun uh, across the board. So, you know, I wouldn't worry about jumping in. Uh, it's prime time. It's ready to go. Uh, it's useful. Make your decisions uh, with your trade-offs kind of eyes wide open. Um, and the last one, I think, is just think in the future. I think it's the biggest thing I think people are missing is these models will be shifting from very large, expensive, uh, large models to specific built models for your code, plus leveraging really good data like the stuff in the orbs, best practice. I mean, the orbs are awesome. I mean, I'm, I, I we really like this because this is the best practices coming out of uh, the, the ecosystem coming from all the other ISVs. So... Um, yeah, happy to, um, I'm going to ask you yeah. a question just about this, uh, tab make can be generated on. Sure. Yeah. For circles, yeah, configuration for sure. Um, in fact, if you use tab nine by default, those, uh, configuration stuff, if they are, uh, in your, on your ID and in terms of where you're running it, it's going to build a local rag that's already brings in a bunch of that, uh, context, right? So. Um, it'll already start on that. If you're using it as a larger organization, you may want to train the model against a larger set of data. So a bunch of orbs plus your own data. Um, that's an aspect, you know, by all means, let us know. But short answer is yes. Um, yes. That, that, that's cool to hear. And let me jump on the other question. Thank you. Like, Mark. can a developer simply remove the sync job from the pipeline in the config file? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Circus AI has something called uh, uh, configuration policies or config policies, which uses OPA framework, which people from the Kubernetes and cloud native world are probably familiar with. And there's a, a language related to OPA framework called Rego. And you can actually write your policies and test these policies even. It's really mature system um, to make sure that, that the, the configuration pipelines that you run uh, are compliant to what your organization requires. So that means that that you can check for these scan jobs that they're actually in there. And then you can hard fill the pipeline or soft fill the pipeline. Everything can be audit locked. So the uh, question is, the answer basically is, yeah, you can really protect these things by using Rego language and the OPA framework that we have um, included in our in our system. Um, we're, we're also working on other ways to, to protect things because again, not black and white, uh, there's always different angles of doing things where you can, for example, uh, store your configuration policies in, in separate repositories and, and pull those in. Uh, so developers can only work on, on the code they are allowed to work on and the configuration list somewhere else. That's all work in progress. Uh, but for now, uh, configuration policies are the most powerful and most industry standard way of, of doing these things. And I think we're really uh, nailing that one with how we implemented it. So, yeah, I think we're uh, also... Any last questions? Yeah, I think we could yeah. squeeze in one or two more if people... But you got to jump on it. So we'll hold for a last minute or two. Otherwise, yeah. uh, data here while we're doing... Um, more than happy jump with you. Uh, I won't speak for Olaf, but I'm, I'm, I am, I don't want to speak for Olaf's time, although I'm going to guess he's on the same place. <laughs> hey, if this brought up some questions, if there's some thinking that you have for your, for your team, for your organization, uh, that either of us can help, uh, please send us an email, uh, you know, be direct on what you're looking for. And we'll either can send you information if you're just trying to, you know, self-educate, happy to get that you, or if you're jumping on and, want to work through a bunch of nuances. I know we hit a lot of things at a relatively high uh, level 
uh, more of how these fit together, 20, 30,000 foot level. Uh, if you want to get down into the weeds, we would really enjoy that opportunity. So, um, Olaf, any last things? Uh, no, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I'm, I'm with you in this. Um, yeah, we're really looking for feedback, input, uh, people uh, asking the right questions to challenge us and to guide us into like what we need to improve, what we need to work on, and and happy to share anything uh, because it's it's a it's a it's a combined effort. We all need to work together, and um, yeah. So uh, ping us, mail us, look us up at LinkedIn, wherever you you can find us, and uh, yeah, happy to jump uh, jump in. So thanks, Brandon. Thanks all the attendees. Thanks for us. Thank you all for spending the time with us. And uh, this will be, I think we'll be publishing it. So if there's others that you thought this was helpful for, uh, it'll be open, available, and you can run it at 2x speed. So feel free to share it. Uh, we'll get that information out to y'all as a follow-up. Thank you for spending the time with us today.